Part 2. Money and Markets Chapter 3. The Ruin of Markets The man of system seems to imagine that he can arrange the different members of a great society with as much ease as the hand arranges the different pieces upon a chessboard. He does not consider that in the great chessboard of human society, every single piece has a principle of motion of its own. Adam Smith, The Theory of Moral Sentiments, 1759 The data from which the economic calculus starts are never for the whole society given to a single mind which could work out the implications and can never be so given. Friedrich A. Hayek, 1945 Any statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed on it for control purposes. Goodhart's Law, 1975 In Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, Solanio asks, Now, what news on the Rialto? He's looking for information, gathering intelligence, and attempting to identify what's happening in the marketplace. Solanio doesn't intend to control the business unfolding around him. He knows he cannot. He looks to understand the flow of news to find his place in the market. Janet Yellen and the Federal Reserve would do well to be as humble. The word market invokes images of everything from prehistoric trade goods to medieval town fairs to postmodern digital exchanges with nanosecond speed bids and offers converging in a computational cloud. In essence, markets are places where buyers and sellers meet to conduct the sale of goods and services. In the world today, place may be an abstract location, a digital venue. A meeting may amount to nothing more than a fleeting connection. But at their core, markets are unchanged since traders swapped amber for ebony on the shores of the Mediterranean during the Bronze Age. Still, markets, whether for tangible commodities like gold or for intangibles such as stocks, have always been about deeper processes than the mere exchange of goods and services. Fundamentally, they are about information exchange concerning the price of goods and services. Prices are portable. Once a merchant or trader ascertains a market price, others can use that information to expand or contract output, hire or fire workers, or move to another marketplace with an informational advantage in tow. Information can have greater value than the underlying transactions from which the information is derived. The multi-billion dollar Bloomberg fortune is based on this insight. How should a venture capitalist price a stake in an enterprise creating an entirely new product? Neither the investor nor the entrepreneur really knows. But information about past outcomes, whether occasional huge gains or frequent failures, gives guidance to the parties and allows an investment to go forward. Information about sales and investment returns is the lubricant and the fuel that allows more sales and investments to take place. An exchange of goods and services may be the result of market activity, but price discovery is the market function that allows an exchange to occur in the first place. Anyone who has ever walked away from a carpet dealer in a Middle Eastern bazaar, only to be chased down by the dealer yelling, Mister, Mister, I have a better price, very cheap, knows the charms of price discovery. This dynamic is no different than the digitized, automated, high frequency trading that takes place in servers adjacent to exchange trading platforms in New York and Chicago. The computer is offering the nanosecond version of, Mister, I have a better price. Price discovery is still the primary market function. But markets are home to more than just buyers and sellers, speculators and arbitrageurs. Global markets today seem irresistible to central bankers with plans for better times. Planning is the central banker's baleful vanity, since for them, markets are a test tube in which to try out their interventionist theories. Central bankers control the price of money and therefore indirectly influence every market in the world. Given this immense power, the ideal central banker would be humble, 
cautious and deferential to market signals. Instead, modern central bankers are both bold and arrogant in their efforts to bend markets to their will. Top-down central planning, dictating resource allocation and industrial output based on supposedly superior knowledge of needs and wants, is an impulse that has infected political players throughout history. It is both ironic and tragic that Western central banks have embraced central planning with gusto in the early 21st century, not long after the Soviet Union and Communist China abandoned it in the late 20th. The Soviet Union and Communist China engaged in extreme central planning over the world's two largest countries and one-third of the Earth's population for more than a hundred years combined. The result was a conspicuous and dismal failure. Today's central planners, especially the Federal Reserve, will encounter the same failure in time. The open issues are when and at what cost to society. The impulse toward central planning often springs from the perceived need to solve a problem with a top-down solution. For Russian communists in 1917, it was the problem of the czar and a feudal society. For Chinese communists in 1949, it was local corruption and foreign imperialism. For the central planners at central banks today, the problem is deflation and low nominal growth. The problems are real, but the top-down solutions are illusory, the product of hubris and false ideologies. In the 20th century, Russians and Chinese adhered to Marxist ideology and the arrogance of the gun. Today, central bankers embrace Keynesianism and the arrogance of the Ph.D. Neither Marxist nor Keynesian ideology allows individuals the degrees of freedom necessary to discover those solutions that emerge spontaneously from the fog of complexity characteristic of an advanced economy. Instead, Individuals sensing manipulation and control from central banks either restrain their economic activity or pursue entirely new, smaller enterprises removed from the sites of central bank market manipulation. Market participants have been left with speculation, churning, and a game of trying to outthink the thinkers in the boardroom at the Federal Reserve. Lately, so-called markets have become a venue for trading ahead of the next Fed policy announcement or piggybacking on its stubborn implementation. Since 2008, markets have become a venue for wealth extraction rather than wealth creation. Markets no longer perform true market functions. In markets today, the dead hands of the academic and the rentier have replaced the invisible hand of the merchant or the entrepreneur. This critique is not new. It's as old as free markets themselves. Adam Smith, in The Theory of Moral Sentiments, a philosophical work from 1759, the dawn of the modern capitalist system, makes the point that no planner can direct a system of arrayed components that are also systems with unique properties beyond the planner's purview. This might be called the Matryoshka theory, named for the Russian dolls nested one inside the other and invisible from the outside. Only when the first doll is opened is the next unique doll revealed, and so on, through a succession of dolls. The difference is that the Matryoshka dolls are finite, whereas variety in a modern economy is infinite, interactive, and beyond comprehension. Friedrich Hayek, in his classic 1945 essay, The Use of Knowledge in Society, written almost 200 years after Adam Smith's work, makes the same argument but with a shift in emphasis. Whereas Smith focused on individuals, Hayek focused on information. This was a reflection of Hayek's perspective on the threshold of the computer age when models based on systems of equations were beginning to dominate economic science. Of course, Hayek was a champion of individual liberty. He understood that the information he wrote about would ultimately be created at the level of individual autonomous actors within a complex economic system. His point was that no individual, committee, or computer program would ever have all the information needed to construct an economic order, even if a model of such order could be devised. Hayek wrote, The peculiar character of the problem of a rational economic order is determined precisely by the fact that the knowledge of the circumstances of which we must make use 
never exists in concentrated or integrated form, but solely as the dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. Or, to put it briefly, it is a problem of the utilization of knowledge which is not given to anyone in its totality. Charles Goodhart first articulated Goodhart's Law in a 1975 paper published by the Reserve Bank of Australia. Goodhart's Law is frequently paraphrased along the lines, When a financial indicator becomes the object of policy, it ceases to function as an indicator. That paraphrase captures the essence of Goodhart's Law, but the original formulation was even more incisive because it included the phrase, for control purposes. In original form, it reads, Any observed statistical regularity will tend to collapse once pressure is placed upon it for control purposes. This phrase emphasized the point that Goodhart was concerned not only with market intervention or manipulation generally, but also on a popular kind of top-down effort by central banks to dictate outcomes in complex systems. Adam Smith, Friedrich Hayek, and Charles Goodhart all concluded that central planning is not merely undesirable or suboptimal, it is impossible. This conclusion aligns with the more recent theory of computational complexity. This theory classifies computational challenges by their degree of difficulty as measured by the data, computing steps, and processing power needed to solve a given problem set. The theory has rules for assigning such classifications, including those problems that are regarded as impossible to compute, because, variously, the data are too voluminous, the processing steps are infinite, all the computational power in the world is insufficient, or all three. Smith, Hayek, and Goodhart all make the point that the variety and adaptability of human action in the economic sphere are a quintessential case of computational complexity that exceeds the capacity of man or machine to optimize. This means not that economic systems cannot approach optimality, but that optimality emerges from economic complexity spontaneously, rather than being imposed by central banks through policy. Today, central banks, especially the U.S. Federal Reserve, are repeating the blunders of Lenin, Stalin, and Mao without the violence although the violence may come yet through income inequality, social unrest, and a confrontation with state power. While the Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek formulations of the economic complexity problem are well known, Charles Goodhart added a chilling coda. What happens when data used by central bankers to set policy is itself the result of prior policy manipulation? The Wealth Effect Measures of inflation, unemployment, income, and other indicators are carefully monitored by central bankers as a basis on which to make policy decisions. Declining unemployment and rising inflation may signal a need to tighten monetary policy, just as falling asset prices may signal a need to provide more monetary ease. Policymakers respond to economic distress by pursuing policies designed to improve the data. After a while, the data themselves may come to reflect not fundamental economic reality, but a cosmetically induced policy result. If these data then guide the next dose of policy, the central banker has entered a wilderness of mirrors in which false signals induce policy, which induces more false signals and more policy manipulation, and so on, in a feedback loop that diverges further from reality until it crashes against a steel wall of data that cannot easily be manipulated, such as real income and output. A case in point is the so-called wealth effect. The idea is straightforward. Two asset classes, stocks and housing, represent most of the wealth of the American people. The wealth represented by stocks is highly visible. Americans receive their 401k account statements monthly, and they can check particular stock prices in real time if they so choose. 
Housing prices are less transparent, but anecdotal evidence gathered from real estate listings and water cooler chatter is sufficient for Americans to have a sense of their home values. Advocates of the wealth effect say that when stocks and home prices are going up, Americans feel richer and more prosperous and are willing to save less and spend more. The wealth effect is one pillar supporting the Fed's zero interest rate policy and profligate money printing since 2008. The transmission channels are easy to follow. If rates are low, more Americans can afford mortgages, which increases home buying, resulting in higher prices for homes. Similarly, with low rates, brokers offer cheap margin loans to clients, which result in more stock buying and higher stock prices. There are also important substitution effects. All investors like to receive a healthy return on their savings and investments. If bank accounts are paying close to zero, Americans will redirect those funds to stocks and housing in search of higher returns, which feeds on itself, resulting in higher prices for stocks and housing. At a superficial level, the zero interest rate and easy money policies have produced the intended outcomes. Stock prices more than doubled from 2009 to 2014, and housing prices began rebounding sharply in mid-2012. After four years of trying to manipulate asset prices, the Fed appeared to have succeeded by 2014. The wealth was being created, at least on paper, but to what effect? The wealth effect's power has been debated for decades, but recent research has cast considerable doubt on its impact. Few economists doubt that the wealth effect exists to an extent. The issues are how strong is it? How long does it last? And is it worth the negative impacts and distortions needed to achieve it? The wealth effect is typically expressed as a percentage increase in consumer spending for each dollar increase in wealth. For example, a $100 billion increase in stock market and housing prices that had a 2% wealth effect could produce a $2 billion increase in consumer spending. The Congressional Budget Office shows that various studies put the wealth effect from housing prices in the range from 1.7 to 21 percent. Such a wide range of estimated effects is risible, casts doubt on similar studies, and highlights the methodological difficulties in this field. A leading study of the wealth effect from stock prices, published by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, contained findings that substantially undermine the Fed's own belief in the wealth effect. The study says, We find a positive connection between aggregate wealth changes and aggregate spending, but the effect is found to be rather unstable and hard to pin down. The response of consumption growth to an unexpected change in wealth is uncertain, and the response appears very short-lived. We find that the wealth effect was rather small in recent years, when we force consumption to respond with a one-period lag, a shock to the growth of wealth has virtually no impact on consumption growth. Another study shows that the wealth effect, to the extent it exists, is heavily concentrated among the rich and has no impact on the spending of everyday Americans. David K. Backus, chairman of the Economics Department at New York University, echoed this view. The idea of wealth effect doesn't stand up to economic data. The stock market boom in the late 1990s helped increase the wealth of Americans, but it didn't produce a significant change in consumption, according to David Backus. Before the stock market reversed itself, you didn't see a big increase in consumption, says Backus, and when it did reverse itself, you didn't see a big decrease. Even more disturbing than doubts about the wealth effect's size and timing is the fact that economists are not even sure about the direction of the effect. While conventional wisdom holds that rising stock prices increase consumption, economists have suggested that it may be the other way around, that rising consumption may increase stock prices. The prominent monetary economist Lacey H. Hunt summarizes the state of research on the wealth effect as follows. The issue here is not whether the Fed's policies cause aggregate wealth to rise or fall. 
The question is whether changes in wealth alter consumer spending to any significant degree. The best evidence says that wealth fluctuations have little or no effect on consumer spending. Thus, when the stock market rises in response to massive Fed liquidity, the broader economy is unaffected. Now, consider that several of the leading studies on the wealth effect were published either in 1999 or in 2007, at the height of the two most recent stock bubbles. It's hardly surprising that academic research on the wealth effect might be of particular interest during stock bubbles when the wealth effect was supposed to be at its strongest, but this research indicates that the wealth effect was actually weak and uncertain. Taken together, all this suggests that while the Federal Reserve is printing trillions of dollars in pursuit of the wealth effect, it may actually be in service to a mere mirage. Asset Bubbles America is today witnessing its third stock bubble and its second housing bubble in the past 15 years. These bubbles do not help the real economy, but merely enrich brokers and bankers. When these bubbles burst, the economy will confront a worse panic than occurred in 2008, and the bankers' cries for bailouts will not be far behind. The hubris of central bankers who do not trust markets, but seek to manipulate them, will be partly to blame. Asset bubble creation is one of the most visible malignancies caused by Federal Reserve money printing. But there are many others. One obvious effect is the export of inflation from the United States to its trading partners through the exchange rate mechanism. A persistent conundrum of Fed monetary policy since 2008 has been the absence of inflation in U.S. consumer prices. From 2008 through 2012, the year-over-year -year increase in the consumer price index averaged just 1.8% per year, the lowest for any five-year period since 1965. Fed critics have expected for years that inflation would rise sharply in the United States in response to money printing, albeit with a lag. But the inflation has not yet appeared. Indeed, persistent deflationary signs began emerging in 2013. The principal reason for the absence of inflation in the United States is that inflation was exported abroad through the exchange rate mechanism. Trading partners of the United States, such as China and Brazil, wanted to promote their exports by preventing their currencies from appreciating relative to the U.S. dollar. As the Fed prints dollars, these trading partners must expand their own money supplies to soak up the dollar flood coming into their economies in the form of trade surpluses or investment. These local money printing policies cause inflation in the trading partner economies. U.S. inflation is muted because Americans import cheap goods from our trading partners. From the start of the new millennium, the world in general, and the United States in particular, have had a natural deflationary bias. Initially, the United States imported this deflation from China in the form of cheap goods produced by abundant labor there, aided by an undervalued currency that caused U.S. dollar prices for Chinese goods to be lower than economic fundamentals dictated. This deflationary bias became pronounced in 2001 when annual U.S. inflation dipped to 1.6 percent, perilously close to outright deflation. It was this deflation scare that prompted then-Fed Chairman Alan Greenspan to sharply lower interest rates. In 2002, the average federal fund's effective rate was 1.67 percent, then the lowest in 44 years. In 2003, the average federal fund's rate was even lower, 1.13 percent, and it remained low through 2004, averaging 1.35 percent for the year. The extraordinarily low interest rate policy during this three-year period was designed to fend off deflation, and it worked. After the usual lag, the consumer price index rose 2.7% in 2004 and 3.4% in 2005. Greenspan was like the pilot of a crashing plane who pulls the aircraft out of a nosedive just before it hits the ground, 
stabilizes the aerodynamics, then regains altitude. By 2007, inflation was back over 4%, and the Fed funds rate was over 5%. Greenspan had fended off the deflation dragon, but in doing so, he had created a worse conundrum. His low-rate policy led directly to an asset bubble in housing, which crashed with devastating impact in late 2007, marking the start of a new depression. Within a year, declining asset values, evaporating liquidity, and lost confidence produced the Panic of 2008, in which tens of trillions of dollars in paper wealth disappeared, seemingly overnight. The Federal Reserve Chairmanship passed from Alan Greenspan to Ben Bernanke in February 2006, just as the housing calamity was starting to unfold. Bernanke inherited Greenspan's deflation problem, which had never really gone away, but had been masked by the 2002 to 2004 easy money policies. The consumer price index reached an interim peak in July 2008, then fell sharply for the remainder of that year. Annual inflation year over year from 2008 to 2009 actually dropped for the first time since 1955. Inflation was turning to deflation again. This time the cause was not the Chinese, but deleveraging. The housing market collapse in 2007 destroyed the collateral value behind $1 trillion in subprime and other low-quality mortgages and trillions of dollars more in derivatives based on those mortgages also collapsed in value. The panic of 2008 forced financial firms and leveraged investors to sell assets in a disorderly fire sale to pay down debt. Other assets came on the market due to insolvencies, such as Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, and AIG. The financial panic spread to the real economy as housing starts ground to a halt and construction jobs disappeared. Unemployment spiked, which was another boost to deflation. Inflation dropped to 1.6% in 2010, identical to the 1.6% rate that had spooked Greenspan in 2001. Renecki's response to the looming threat from deflation was even more aggressive than Greenspan's response to the same threat almost a decade earlier. Renecki lowered the effective Fed funds rate to close to zero in 2008, where it has remained ever since. The world is witnessing a climactic battle between deflation and inflation. The deflation is endogenous, derived from emerging markets' productivity, demographic shifts, and balance sheet deleveraging. The inflation is exogenous, coming from central bank interest rate policy and money printing. Price index time series are not mere data points. They are more like a seismograph that measures tectonic plates pushing against each other on a fault line. Often the fault line is quiet, almost still. At other times it is active, as pressure builds and one plate pushes under another. Inflation was relatively active in 2011 as the year-over-year -year increase reached 3.2%. Deflation got the upper hand in late 2012. A four-month stretch from September to December 2012 produced a steady decline in the consumer price index. The economy is neither in an inflationary nor a deflationary mode. It is experiencing both at the same time from different causes. Price indexes reveal how these offsetting forces are playing out. This dynamic has profound implications for policy. It means the Fed cannot stop its easing policy so long as the fundamental deflationary forces are in place. If the Fed relented in its money printing, deflation would quickly dominate the economy, with disastrous consequences for the national debt, government revenue, and the banking system. But deflation's root causes are not going away either. At least a billion more workers will enter the labor force in Asia, Africa, and Latin America in the coming decades, which will keep downward pressure on costs and prices. Meanwhile, a demographic debacle in developed countries will put downward pressure on aggregate demand in these advanced economies. Finally, 
technological breakthroughs are accelerating and promise higher productivity with cheaper goods and services. The energy revolution in natural gas, shale oil, and fracking is another deflationary force. In short, the world wants to deflate while governments want to inflate. Neither force will relent, so the pressure between them will continue to build. It is just a matter of time before the economy experiences more than just bubbles, but an earthquake in the form of either a deeper depression or higher inflation, as one force rapidly and unexpectedly overwhelms the other. Tremors Expected earthquakes of great magnitude near large population centers are colloquially referred to as the big one. But before those big quakes appear, they may be preceded by small tremors that wreak havoc in localities along the fault line far from the big cities. The same can be said for the Fed's market interventions. In its desperate effort to fight deflation, the Fed is causing minor meltdowns in markets far removed from the main arena of U.S. government bond interest rates. The unintended and unforeseen consequences of the Fed's easy money policies are becoming more visible, costly, and problematic in many ways. An overview of these malignancies reveals how the Fed's quixotic pursuit of the deflation dragon is doomed to fail. While inflation was quite low from 2008 to 2013, it was not zero. Yet, growth in personal income and household income was close to zero. This meant that real incomes declined even in a low inflation environment. If the Fed had instead allowed deflation, real incomes would have risen even without nominal gains because consumer goods prices would have been lower. In this way, deflation is the working man's bonus because it allows an increase in the living standard even when wages are stagnant. Instead, real incomes declined. Economist Lacey Hunt captured this effect succinctly when he wrote, since wages remained soft, real income of the vast majority of American households fell. If the Fed had not taken such extraordinary steps, interest rates and inflation would be lower currently than they are, and we could have avoided the unknowable risks embodied in the Fed's swelling balance sheet. In essence, the Fed has impeded the healing process, delayed a return to normal economic growth, and worsened the income wealth divide while creating a new problem how to exit its failed policies. Another unintended consequence of Fed policy involves the impact on savers. The Federal Reserve's zero-interest rate policy causes a $400 billion per year wealth transfer from everyday Americans to large banks. This is because a normalized interest rate environment of 2% would pay $400 billion to savers who leave money in the bank. Instead, those savers get nothing, and the benefit goes to banks who can relend the free money on a leveraged basis and make significant profits. Part of the Fed's design is to penalize savers and discourage them from leaving money in the bank, and to encourage them to invest in risky assets, such as stocks and real estate, to prop up collateral values in those markets. But many savers are inherently conservative, and with good reason. An 82-year-old retiree does not want to invest in stocks because she could easily lose 30% of her retirement savings when the next bubble bursts. A 22-year-old professor saving for a down payment on his first condo may avoid stocks for the same reason. Both savers hope to get a reasonable return on their bank accounts, but the Fed uses rate policy to ensure that they receive nothing. As a result, many citizens are saving even more from retirement checks and paychecks to make up for the lack of a market interest rate. So, a Fed manipulation designed to discourage savings actually increases savings on a precautionary basis to make up for lost interest. This is a behavioral response not taught in textbooks or included in models used by the Fed. Federal Reserve policy has also damaged lending to small and medium-sized enterprises, known as SMEs. This does not trouble the Fed because it favors the interests of large banks. 
Johns Hopkins professor Steve Hankey has recently pointed out the reason for this damage to SME lending. SME loans, he argues, are funded by banks through interbank lending. In effect, Bank A lends money to Bank B in the interbank market so that Bank B can fund a loan to a small business. But such lending is unattractive to banks today because the interbank lending rate is zero due to Fed intervention. Since banks cannot earn a market return on such interbank lending, they don't participate in that market. As a result, liquidity in the interbank lending market is low, and banks can no longer be confident that they can obtain funds when needed. Banks are therefore reluctant to expand their SME loan portfolios because of uncertain funding. The resulting credit crunch for SMEs is one reason unemployment remains stubbornly high. Big businesses such as Apple and IBM don't need banks to fund growth. They have no problem funding activities from internal cash resources or the bond markets. But big business does not create new jobs. The job creation comes largely from small business. So when the Fed distorts the interbank lending market by keeping rates too low, it deprives small business of working capital loans and hurts their ability to fund job creation. Other unintended consequences of Fed policy are more opaque and insidious. One such consequence is perilous behavior by banks in search of yield. With interest rates near zero, financial institutions have a difficult time making sufficient returns on equity and they resort to leverage, the use of debt or derivatives, to increase their returns. Leverage from debt expands a bank's balance sheet and simultaneously increases its capital requirements. Therefore, financial institutions prefer derivatives strategies using swaps and options to achieve the targeted returns since derivatives are recorded off balance sheet and do not require as much capital as borrowings. Counterparties to derivatives trades require high-quality collateral, such as treasury notes, to guarantee contractual performance. Often the quality of assets available for these bank collateral pledges is poor. In these circumstances, the bank that wants to do the off-balance sheet transaction will engage in an asset swap with an institutional investor, whereby the bank gives the investor low-rated securities in exchange for highly rated securities such as treasury notes. The bank promises to reverse the transaction at a later date so the institutional investor can get its treasury notes back. Once the bank has the treasury notes, it can pledge them to the derivatives counterparty as good collateral and enter into the trade, thus earning high returns off balance sheet with scant capital required. As a result of the asset swap, a two-party trade turns into a three-party trade, with more promises involved and a more complex web of reciprocal obligations involving banks and non-bank investors. These machinations work, as long as markets stay calm and there is no panic to repossess collateral. But in a liquidity crisis of the kind experienced in 2008, these densely constructed webs of interlocking obligations quickly frees up as the demand for good collateral instantaneously exceeds the supply, and parties scramble to dump all collateral at fire sale prices to raise cash. As a result of the scramble to seize good collateral, another liquidity-driven panic soon begins, producing tremors in the market. Asset swaps are just one of many ways financial institutions increase risk in the search for higher yields in low-interest rate environments. A definitive study conducted by the IMF covering the period 1997 to 2011 showed that Federal Reserve low interest rate policy is consistently associated with greater risk taking by banks. The IMF study also demonstrated that the longer rates are held low, the greater the amount of risk taking by the banks. The study concludes that extended periods of exceptionally low interest rates of the kind the Fed has engineered since 2008 are a recipe for increased systemic risk. By manipulating interest rates to zero, the Fed encourages this search for yield and all the off-balance sheet tricks and asset swaps that go with it. In the course of putting out the fire from the last panic, the Fed has supplied kindling for an even greater conflagration.
the clouded crystal ball. The most alarming consequence of Fed manipulation is the prospect of a stock market crash playing out over a period of a few months or less. This could result from Fed policy based on forecasts that are materially wrong. In fact, the accuracy of Fed forecasts has long been abysmal. If the Fed underestimates potential growth, then interest rates will be too low, with inflation and negative real interest rates a likely result. Such conditions hurt capital formation and, historically, have produced the worst returns for stocks. Conversely, if the Fed overestimates potential growth, then policy will be too tight, and the economy will go into recession, which hurts corporate profits and causes stocks to decline. In other words, forecasting errors in either direction produce policy errors that will result in a declining stock market. The only condition that is not eventually bad for stocks is if the Fed's forecast is highly accurate and its policy is correct, which, unfortunately, is the least likely scenario. Given high expectations for equities, bank interconnectedness, and hidden leverage, any weakness in stock markets can easily cascade into a market crash. This is not certain to happen, but it is likely based on current conditions and past forecasting errors by the Federal Reserve. As these illustrations show, the consequences of Federal Reserve market manipulation extend far beyond policy interest rates. Fed policy punishes savings, investment, and small business. The resulting unemployment is deflationary, although the Fed is desperately trying to promote inflation. This nascent deflation strengthens the dollar, which then weakens the dollar price of gold and other commodities, making the deflation worse. Conversely, Fed policies intended to promote inflation in the United States, partly through exchange rates, make deflation worse in the economies of U.S. trading partners, such as Japan. And these trading partners fight back by cheapening their own currencies. Japan is currently the most prominent example. The Japanese yen crashed 33% against the U.S. dollar in an eight-month stretch from mid-September 2012 to mid-May 2013. The cheap yen was intended to increase inflation in Japan through higher import prices for energy, but it also hurt Korean exports from companies such as Samsung and Hyundai that compete with Japanese exports from Sony and Toyota. This caused Korea to cut interest rates to cheapen its currency, and so on around the world, in a blur of rate cuts, money printing, imported inflation, and knock-on effects triggered by Fed manipulation of the world's reserve currency. The result is not effective policy. The result is global confusion. The Federal Reserve defends its market interventions as necessary to overcome market dysfunctions such as those witnessed in 2008 when liquidity evaporated and confidence in money market funds collapsed. Of course, it is also true that the 2008 liquidity crisis was itself the product of earlier Fed policy blunders starting in 2002. While the Fed is focused on the intended effects of its policies, it seems to have little regard for the unintended ones. The Asymmetric Market In the Fed's view, the most important part of its program to mitigate fear in markets is communications policy, also called forward guidance, through which the Fed seeks to amplify easing's impact by promising it will continue for sustained periods of time or until certain unemployment and inflation targets are reached. The policy debate over forward guidance, as an adjunct to market manipulation, is a continuation of one of the most long-standing areas of intellectual inquiry in modern economics. This inquiry involves imperfect information or information asymmetry, a situation in which one party has superior information to another that induces suboptimal behavior in both parties. This field took flight in the 1970 paper by George Akerlof, The Market for Lemons, that chose used car sales as an example to make its point. Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001 in part for this work. The seller of a used car, he states, 
knows perfectly well whether the car runs smoothly or is of poor quality, a lemon. The buyer does not know. Hence, an information asymmetry arises between buyer and seller. The unequal information then conditions behavior in adverse ways. Buyers might assume that all used cars are lemons, otherwise the sellers would hang on to them. And this belief causes buyers to lower the prices they are willing to pay. Sellers of high-quality used cars might reject the extra-low prices offered by buyers and refuse to sell. In an extreme case, there might be no market at all for used cars because buyers and sellers are too far apart on price, even though there would theoretically be a market-clearing price if both sides to the transaction knew all the facts. Used cars are just one illustration of the asymmetric information problem, which can apply to a vast array of goods and services, including financial transactions. Interestingly, gold does not suffer this problem because it has a uniform grade. Absent fraud, there are no lemons when it comes to gold bars. A touchstone for economists since 1970, Akerlof's work has been applied to numerous problems. The implications of his analysis are profound. If communication can be improved and information asymmetries reduced, markets become more efficient and perform their price discovery functions more smoothly reducing costs to consumers. In 1980, the challenge of analyzing information's role in efficient markets was picked up by a 26-year-old economist named Ben S. Bernanke, and a paper called Irreversibility, Uncertainty, and Cyclical Investment. Bernanke addressed the decision-making process behind an investment, asking how uncertainty regarding future policy and business conditions impedes such investment. This was a momentous question. Investment is one of the four fundamental components of GDP, along with consumption, government spending, and net exports. Of these components, investment may be the most important because it drives GDP not only when the investment is made, but in future years through a payoff of improved productivity. Investment in new enterprises can also be a catalyst for hiring which can then boost consumption through wage payments from investment profits. Any impediments to investment will have a deleterious effect on the growth of the overall economy. Lack of investment was a large contributor to the duration of the Great Depression. Scholars from Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz to Ben Bernanke have identified monetary policy as a leading cause of the Depression. But far less work has been done on why the Great Depression lasted so long compared to the relatively brief Depression of 1920. Charles Kindleberger correctly identified the cause of the protracted nature of the Great Depression as regime uncertainty. This theory holds that even when market prices have declined sufficiently to attract investors back into the economy, investors may still refrain because unsteady public policy makes it impossible to calculate returns with any degree of accuracy. Regime uncertainty refers to more than just the usual uncertainty of any business caused by changing consumer preferences or the more or less efficient execution of a business plan. It refers to the added uncertainty caused by activist government policy, ostensibly designed to improve conditions that typically make matters worse. The publication date of Bernanke's paper, 1980, is poised in the midst of the three great periods of regime uncertainty in the past 100 years, the 1930s, the 1970s, and the 2010s. In the 1930s, this uncertainty was caused by the erratic, on-again, off-again nature of the Hoover-Roosevelt interventionist policies of price controls, price subsidies, labor laws, gold confiscation, and more exacerbated by Supreme Court decisions that supported certain programs and voided others. Even with huge pools of unused labor and rock-bottom prices, capitalists sat on the sidelines in the 1930s until the policy uncertainty cloud was lifted by duress during the Second World War and finally by tax cuts in 1946. It was only when government got out of the way that the U.S. economy finally escaped the Great Depression.
In the 1970s, the U.S. economy was experiencing another episode of extreme regime uncertainty. This episode lasted 10 years, beginning with Nixon's 1971 wage and price controls and abandonment of the gold standard, and continuing through Jimmy Carter's 1980 crude oil windfall profit tax. The same malaise afflicts the U.S. economy today due to regime uncertainty caused by budget battles, health care regulation, tax policy, and environmental regulation. The issue is not whether each policy choice is intrinsically good or bad. Most investors can roll with the punches when it comes to bad policy. The core issue is that investors do not know which policy will be favored and therefore cannot calculate returns with sufficient clarity to risk capital. In his 1980 paper, Bernanke began his analysis by recapitulating the classic distinction between risk and uncertainty, first made by Frank H. Knight in 1921. In Knight's parlance, risk applies to random outcomes that investors can model with known probabilities, while uncertainty applies to random outcomes with unknown probabilities. An investor is typically willing to confront risk, but may be paralyzed in the face of extreme uncertainty. Bernanke's contribution was to construct the problem as one of opportunity cost. Investors may indeed fear uncertainty, but they may also have a fear of inaction, and the costs of inaction may exceed the costs of plunging into the unknown. Conversely, the costs of inaction may be reduced by the benefits of awaiting new information. In Bernanke's formulation, it will pay to invest when the cost of waiting exceeds the expected gains from waiting. The expected gain from waiting is the probability that new information will make the investor regret his decision to invest. The motive for waiting is concern over the possible arrival of unfavorable news. This passage is the Rosetta Stone for interpreting all of Bernanke's policies relating to monetary policy during his time as chairman of the Federal Reserve. After 2008, Bernanke's Fed would increase the cost of waiting by offering investors zero return on cash and would reduce the cost of moving ahead by offering forward guidance on policy. By increasing the costs of waiting and reducing the costs of moving ahead, Bernanke would tip the scales in favor of immediate investment and help the economy grow through the jobs and incomes that go with such investment. Bernanke would be the master planner, who pushes capitalists back into the investment game. He showed his hand when he wrote, It would not be difficult to recast our example of the economy in an equilibrium business cycle mold. As given, the economy is best thought of as being run by a central planner. Bernanke's logic is deeply flawed because it supposes that the agency that reduces uncertainty does not also add to uncertainty by its conduct. When the Fed offers forward guidance on interest rates, how certain can investors be that it will not change its mind? When the Fed says it will raise interest rates upon the occurrence of certain conditions, how certain can investors be that those conditions will ever be satisfied? In trying to remove one type of uncertainty, the Fed merely substitutes a new uncertainty related to its ability to perform the first task. Uncertainty about future policy has been replaced with uncertainty about the reliability of forward guidance. This may be the second derivative of uncertainty, but it is uncertainty, nonetheless, made worse by dependence on planners' whims rather than the market's operation. An important paper by Robert Hall of Stanford University, delivered at the Fed's Jackson Hole gathering in August 2013, demonstrates the counterproductive nature of Bernanke's reasoning. Hall's paper makes the point that the decision to hire a new worker implicitly involves a calculation by the employer of the present value of the worker's future output. Present value calculations depend on the discount rates used to convert future returns into current dollars, but uncertainty caused by the Fed's policy flip-flops makes the discount rate difficult to ascertain and causes employers to reduce or delay hiring. In effect, the Fed's efforts to stimulate the economy are actually retarding it. Free markets matter not because of ideology, 
but because of efficiency. They are imperfect, yet they are better than the next best thing. Akerlof illustrates the costs of information asymmetry at one point in time, while Bernanke shows the costs of information uncertainty over time. Both are correct about these theoretical costs, but both ignore the full costs of trying to fix the problem with government intervention. Akerlof was at least humble about these limitations, while Bernanke exhibited a central planner's hubris throughout his career. Adam Smith and Friedrich Hayek warned of the impossibility of the Fed's task and the dangers of attempting it. But Charles Goodhart points to a greater danger. Even the central planner requires market signals to implement a plan. A Soviet-style clothing commissar who orders that all wool socks be the color green might be interested to know that green is deeply unpopular and the socks will sit on the shelves. The Fed relies on price signals, too, particularly those related to inflation, commodity prices, stock prices, unemployment, housing, and many other variables. What happens when you manipulate markets using price signals that are the output of manipulated markets? This is the question posed by Goodhart's Law. The central planner must suspend belief in one's own intervention to gather information about the intervention's effects. But that information is a false signal, because it is not the result of free market activity. This is a recursive function. In plain English, the central planner has no option but to drink his own Kool-Aid. This is the great dilemma for the Federal Reserve and all central banks that seek to direct their economies out of the new depression. The more these institutions intervene in markets, the less they know about real economic conditions, and the greater the need to intervene. One form of Knightian uncertainty is replaced by another. Regime uncertainty becomes pervasive as capital waits for the return of real markets. Unlike Shakespeare's Solanio, we can no longer trust what the markets tell us. That's because those who control them do not trust the markets themselves. Yellen and the rest have come to think their academic hand is more powerful than Adam Smith's invisible one. The result has been the slow demise of market utility that, in turn, presages the slow demise of the real economy and of the dollar. <laughs>